We come now to what is, I suspect, both a, in some sense, a review of the scientific materials uh, with which some of the other speakers have been concerned, but also a decided <coughs> movement beyond them in certain specific directions. As we have planned this conference and consulted with those who knew their way around in the field, there was no question that Dr. Francis O. Schmidt of Massachusetts Institute of Technology had to be included and ought to be consulted, that he had perhaps the widest range and the longest experience in concentrated effort at uncovering the facts about the biochemistry of the mind and uh, molecular biology generally. As chairman of the neurosciences research program, he is in the forefront, not only himself, but he is in relation to all of, or to a very large number of people who have a similar concern. We have been delighted by his interest in this particular conference by uh, the range of his concerns about the kind of interests that lie behind this conference, and we look forward with real pleasure and anticipation to his lecture now, which will be on biophysical and biogenetic parameters in mental process. Dr. Smith. President Carlson, fellow students. This invitation to come here uh, has been uh, a source of much joy to me. Uh, a lot of work, but much joy. And in coming here and hearing the reports of our colleagues and in talking to many of you, this, uh, this uh, dividend has been very greatly increased indeed. Now, when I got the program from headquarters here, it showed three brain scientists, one after the other, followed by a philosopher, followed by a theologian, and then came I. And I wondered just what they expected of me after all that. And uh, I intend to talk about the lowest uh, aspect of this subject, which is the molecular and the submolecular. And how, where can you go after theology? I mean, uh, even, well, they said, never mind, go ahead. And so, <laughs> as a matter of fact, Dr. Gustafson uh, provided uh, an excellent uh, takeoff for me in many ways, as you will see as we go along. Now, it's in the spirit of humility, intellectual humility at least, that the basic brain scientist stands before the problem of the human mind and the brain. Yet his insights tell him that in this incomprehensibly complex field lies the opportunity to construct a new theoretical biology, which, which doesn't exist at the present time, but which, like its already established counterpart, theoretical physics, might have powerful explicative, predictive, and control capabilities. No longer is it unfashionable for physicists and chemists to enter the life sciences field professionally. 20 years ago, uh, not to say 30 years ago or so, I doubt that, well, no physicist would get caught dead working in anything as complex as this. But now, as in post-war molecular genetics, physicists and chemists may well be the pioneers not only in molecular neurology, by which I mean the investigation of the nervous system at or near the molecular level, but also in the neurosciences more broadly conceived. As a matter of fact, uh, I might as well mention something about our neurosciences uh, research program to which uh, Dr. Hedan yesterday referred as NRP. Uh, in the course of my discussion, I will refer to work sessions and to associates. These are our colleagues in this joint effort, and the work session is, as I shall, if I have time, explain later, a concentrated effort to get at the information, the facts, 
and the state of the art in particular areas. Well, now, uh, molecular neurology is, uh, as I've explained, uh, simply attempting to apply molecular biology, which has been so very successful in molecular uh, genetics and following that in molecular immunology, and is now being applied broadly in molecular neurology. And from where we sit in this uh, position uh, in the neurosciences uh, program, we are able to see how the physicists, the bright young theoretical physicists of today, are beginning to flock to this field. And it's very much as they did after World War II, not merely to escape being the 15th man on a cyclotron team or because they didn't like the bomb, but because of a very definite positive attraction to a field which obviously had enormous capability. This is happening today. Uh, theoretical physicists are forsaking their field. I could name them to you if you like, uh, in the sense that not that they are forgetting their physics, but that they are applying it in this new area of the life of the brain sciences and behavioral sciences. And it's my task to indicate some of the recent conceptual contributions of biophysics and biogenetics, and the word biogenetics here is in, uh, intended to be a mixture of biochemistry of high polymers primarily, uh, and genetic principles, primarily biosynthesis in the cell, the applications of these to brain sciences, and to read to you the messages that I have deciphered on some of the guideposts I have encountered in our NRP uh, concerning the possible shape of things to come. And my discussion will be along uh, four lines. First, I will deal rather briefly with, I will pay my respects to the title of this lecture series by dealing briefly with the mind-brain problem. Secondly, I will deal with certain major concepts of brain science as such uh, along two lines. First, what I shall call classical, more or less classical, though the leaders uh, such as Sir John in this field are still are here and uh, their work is, is going on very vigorously, and certain new developments which uh, are coming out which suggest a movement in another direction. Then I sh the, major, the major time of my discourse will be on molecular neurobiology from the biophysical and the biogenetic aspect. Finally, if there is time, I should like to say just a word about the opportunities and the challenge of this field. First then about the mind and the brain. Psychologists today tend to avoid serious discussion of the mind and of mental so-called processes as unproductive, saying that when the experimenter is also the experimental subject, it is impossible to derive sound, objective, scientific information. For example, in Ryle's book, uh, the first chapter of Ryle's book, where he states that the distinction between the mind and the brain is a mere, merely verbal and not real. It is a case of complementarity. Rather, problems are stated by these psychologists uh, and experiments are designed along purely operational lines. What is of significance, say the behaviorist, is what the subject, not, is what the subject does and how he acts, not what he says or thinks. The word psyche is eschewed and, if it were possible, all of its derivatives, nominative and ad adjectival, would be discarded, including the word psychology itself, I suppose. In other words, let's have nothing to do with mind. But we're going to talk about that today. So consciousness is also considered an abstraction, though it is admitted that consciousness of something does exist, as Dr. Kibbe says. The role of the uh, consciousness as an entity would be denied. The role of brain function in conscious experience has been widely discussed in recent years. Two volumes are especially valuable, and I give this out to you as students who might care to look at this. The first of these, called Brain Mechanisms and Consciousness, based on a conference arranged by Adrian Vermeer and Jasper, leaders in their field, with a volume published in 1956, contains papers by 19 leaders of neurophysiology, neuroanatomy, neurosurgery, psychology, and psychiatry, and includes a record of the discussions. The discussion there foreshadowed the advances in neural correlates of psychological processes such as sleep, wakefulness, consciousness, conditioning, and so on. Now, what I mean by that is that psychologists, of course, have been working with these uh, aspects in a rather phenomenological way for many years, 
And those who know something about the brain, you see many psychologists uh, treat the brain as a black box with no reference to the circuitry therein, or any care about it for that matter. It's treated purely phenomenologically. Uh, nevertheless, there have been those who have le forsaken the black box uh, group and have tried to obtain neural correlates. That means to, to actually follow the pathways responsible for sleep or wakefulness or uh, conditioning and so on. And these ref uh, reflect dissatisfaction. This uh, dissatisfaction is vaguely expressed in this book with canonical uh, connectionistic neurophysiology. Now, what I mean by that, I'm going to dwell on that for a little while. And that has to do with the idea that circuits in the brain, uh, in sequential neuronal circuits, uh, in which one neuron fires the next, the next, the next, in highly specific circuits in the terribly complex uh, weave of the brain, to which uh, there might be uh, 100,000, indeed a million, of these firing in a particular in the recall of a, of a particular memory. I don't know this is a fact, but it's possible. Well, uh, there, is, there was expressed in that book a vague uh, uh, dissatisfaction with a uh, positivistic view about uh, all of neurophysiology being explained in circuitry. The second volume, based on a conference sponsored by the Pontifical Academy of Science, was arranged by our first speaker, Sir John Eccles, who also edited the volume entitled Brain and Conscious Be Experience. This was published last year. The second, this second volume reflects the great advances that were made in the decade intervening since the first volume. The conference participants were chiefly neurophysiologists, psychologists, and ethologists. The importance of careful identification of categories of co our complementary inner and outer aspects and of avoid mixing the complementary dualistic mental and physical categories, mind and brain, was stressed by many of these authors, particularly by Mackay, who had written an earlier paper entitled A Mind's Eye View of the Brain, and who provided an interesting and useful model based on communication science, which he, Mackay, regards as providing a bridge between the levels of physiology and anatomy on the one hand, and of conscious behavior on the other hand well worth reading. Neither conference nor resulting books, valuable as landmarks uh, in the application of brain science to the problem of the mind and conscious behavior, were leavened by biochemical or uh, molecular science. This will form the main substance of my contribution in this present lecture series. Now, the main mind-brain problem in the last few years has been illuminated by new techniques involving telemetric recording of neuroelectric data from indwelling electrodes in the brains of animals and of human beings, which have been nothing short of spectacular. Those who have, like me, grown up uh, in the early beginnings of bioelectric techniques, when it was uh, a great triumph to record action potentials at all, my teacher, Erlanger and Gasser, uh, won their Nobel Prize for being able to apply electronics in doing just this. Uh, with a room full of apparatus. Now, all of that is applicable to minute potentials which are generated by the brain, picked up by the, on the scalp of astronauts, and sent by radio broadcast to the Earth, where uh, neurophysiologists record these things and figure out, for example, precisely what astronaut uh, X was doing when he was asleep, as far as his brainwave was concerned, and so on. So that we have the possibility now, not only of recording brain waves, but of broadcasting them. And we'll see how this direct stimulation of the brain regions electrically and with chemical tele telemetrically injected into the brain was thus also made possible. And Dr. Gustafson referred today to his colleague uh, Delgado's work at Yale. Delgado uh, has pioneered, a master in technique, has pioneered in the insertion of electrodes into animals' brains, behaving animals, that is. His point was that he did not wish to have the animal uh, anesthetized on the board uh, and see what about brain waves, but rather he wanted to have the animal in free ranging within his own colony and in the presence of his uh, colony mates. And this became possible by having, within dwelling electrodes and telemetric uh, procedures, having uh, 
uh, recording directly in that fashion. It was even possible with such indwelling electrodes to have individual animals learn to stimulate the brains of their colleagues in the, in the uh, colony. Uh, what Dr. Gustafson referred to was in fact true. He did put electrodes into a bull in the ring at Madrid I visited there and I confirmed this as well as having Delgado come and chair a work session for us. And uh, he did press a button when the bull was charging and the bull did uh, pull up uh, short and give it up for a bad job. <laughs> uh, now, if any of you think that's easy, I mean, quite apart from the uh, radio technique and so on, you just try to get through a bull's head. I tried it once on a mule and... Uh, uh, <laughs> Dr. Ketty has already referred to the striking psychological effect uh, on mood and affect of certain powerful biogenic amines and other compounds of this sort. Uh, Delgado, for example, also has made it possible to inject telemetrically, to inject into the brain, into specific brain regions, a bit of very potent compounds of one sort or another, along with stimu direct stimulation of the brain to see what these compounds do when applied locally. Electrical stimulation in the, rat, in the rat of certain brain regions produces either sleep or arousal or gratification, as Dr. Ketty pointed out in telling the work of Olds yesterday. <coughs> and uh, it depends very importantly on brain region as to what that's stimulated, as to what happens. But direct electrical stimulation of brain regions in human subjects in the course of therapy for disease such as Parkinsonism, epilepsy, and so on, results in striking changes in mood and mental satisfaction, temporarily relieving anxiety and depression after a brief 30-second stimulation. The psychological effects may persist for hours. Uh, in line with Dr. Gustafson's uh, remarks, I would say that uh, uh, that such investigations have to be done under the most carefully controlled ethical code. I happen to be a trustee of the Massachusetts General Hospital, and we have a standing committee uh, which acts on all such cases in which a human subject is involved in any kind of manipulative uh, uh, experiment. Or this is not an experiment. What is actually happening in this case is that an attempt is being made uh, by therapy to interfere with brain circuits uh, in the case of epileptic persons. Nevertheless, uh, the information which is coming from such experiments is extraordinarily valuable. Uh, they indicate global, highly personal psychological effects as reported by the patient. Uh, and uh, I have talked, for example, with Dr. Frank Irvin, who testified at one of our work sessions on this subject. The patient, uh, an epileptic, uh, who has come in for treatment, who requires it badly, uh, has been depressed and very badly depressed and uh, comes in in the morning with his indwelling electrodes in his brain and uh, his limbic system is stimulated uh, for a period of 30 seconds or something of this sort and the depression seems to melt from his face and a, a feeling of, of uh, relief and so on, uh, finally getting perhaps slightly euphoric, uh, comes on. Uh, so there's no question whatever about a direct psychological effect of stimulation of certain regions of the brain. Uh, very interestingly, uh, such patients might report a lateralized queasy feeling. I feel queasy on the left side, or I feel real good on the right side. Now, <laughs> we weren't ready for that. <laughs> to obtain these psychological effects, it is not necessary to stimulate specific regions in the brain, but stimulation almost anywhere in the limbic system seems uh, to suffice. Perhaps the interweaving of fine nerve fibers in the neuropod, this reticular system of intermeshed fibers, makes generalized stimulation effective in this area. Well, such results with human beings reported at a recent, this re recent work session seem to provide a link between the physical, physiological, and psychological factors. Biochemical, such as Dr. Ketty talked about yesterday, and electrical means it is possible to intrude into and alter the mental processes in human patients 
who can report their subjective experience as close correlates of the experimental procedure. Elaboration of this approach exercising, as I said, the utmost care to avoid ethical codes relating to human patients as subjects bids fair to have a salutary influence on the development of psychology and on psychologists who have been so reluctant to deal with mental processes as distinguished from behavioral processes. Dr. Sams, to whom Dr. Ketty also referred yesterday as the wife of Dr. Everts, whose work he characterized, has pointed out that, quote, 20th century psychology has divorced itself from its historical underpinnings and tries to become a science like physics, taking its data solely from observable behavior, eschewing mentalistic constructs as meaningless and valueless. Perhaps the recent experiments on direct stimulation of the human brain, besides intruding into private precincts of the mind, can, with physiology and philosophy, as Sem suggests, help psychology over the threshold into the tabooed land of the mind and encourage psychology to recover its lost subject matter. <laughs> Biophysical and biochemical factors will doubtless play an increasingly important role in direct clinical intervention in mental processes of human patients. However, my primary concern today is to portray new data and new conceptual vistas concerning the role of biophysical and biogenetic processes in brain function and their correlates or their actual mechanisms, in mental processes. It will, I hope, become evident that these new advances are ushering in a new era of the neurosciences, one of dynamism, cooperative macromolecular effects, and you'll see a little later what that word cooperative means in a slightly technical connotation, and incomprehensible specificity. It's impossible to comprehend the specificity that is built into a protein molecule weighing 100,000. All of this near, at or near the molecular level. Well then, first, about concepts and limitations of classical and neuroclassical sciences. Now, Prexy, I'm afraid uh, I'm going to do this kind of thing here. Next, first slide, please. <laughs> and the first slide, you're safe there. <laughs> First, uh, I want to show you a neuron. You've heard a lot about the neuron in the last uh, 24 hours, and I want to show you one. Uh, this, is the, this is the nerve cell with its uh, cell body and the nucleus and its dendrites, uh, which in a synapse uh, will receive the boutons from, the, uh, the, from another ner many other nerve cells. And here is the axon growing out of the, ner of the nerve cell, which goes on for a long way in my back. Some of these might go all the way down to my big toe, and that would be, you can see, well over a yard uh, long, that this uh, nerve fiber would go out, a very improbable structure indeed. And this is a kind of a fatty sheath called the myelin sheath. We won't follow that. And here it ends in many divisions, uh, finally to end on the end organ, either a muscle or a blood vessel or a gland or something of that sort. And uh, when a lot of these are in parallel, we call it a nerve. That's a nerve or a nerve bundle. Uh, otherwise, this is called the axon. And here is the synapse where two uh, join. Now, I'm going to, now, what actually happens physiologically is that a disturbance is set up here, uh, which travels down the, neuro down the nerve fiber, the axon, to its ending and sets up the same kind of disturbance in the next neuron in the chain. This is called uh, an action potential. It is electrical, and I'll try to show you its molecular mechanism or what I think it is. Uh, this travels at a speed of anywhere from one or two yards per second to 100 yards per second in your larger fibers. So you can see, and, and moreover, it lasts at any one point for about a thousandth of a second. So if you were sitting right here and the impulse went by you, you'd see it went by at a speed of about 100 yards a second, and uh, it only lasted about a thousandth to a ten thousandth of a second. Now, we have to explain that in molecular terms, and I'll show you what I think it is. Next slide, please. Now, uh, first I'd like to say something about Romani Cajal. This is Dr. Cajal, the great uh, Spanish neuroanatomist. And uh, he, uh, the, if you ever visit Madrid, you may care to see the Cajal Institute. It is uh, a sanctum, I can tell you. Uh, this was the greatest neuroanatomist that ever lived, I feel sure, though I'm not a neuroanatomist. And uh, he, uh, 
he uh, developed methods of staining using Golgi methods and use of osmic acid and silver and gold methods, which permitted one to follow these neurons in this unbelievably complex maze of the brain. However, with all of his techniques, and indeed with those of the present day, including those of Nauta, who is the leader in this field, uh, uh, Dr. Nauta says it's like uh, looking at a forest in which only one out of every hundred trees can be seen. Uh, Nauta doesn't believe that more than one or two percent of the neurons in his sections are stained by his best stains. Now, you're trying to discover the circuitry of a brain in which you can only see one or two percent of the components. No uh, engineer in his right, right mind would try to construct a circuit on that basis. Well, now, the thing that Cajal, the so-called Cajal doctrine of the neurons, states that unlike the, the uh, theory which uh, prevailed before that time, namely, that uh, the brain contains a reticulum of circuits and that somehow processes are occurring in this enormous uh, circuit uh, reticulum uh, that corresponds to mental processes, Cajal uh, established the identity of the nerve cell, the neuron, as the element, the unit of the nervous system. And he felt that and proved that where neurons join in the synapse, it's contiguity but not continuity, and that the individual cell, he established what might be called neurobiology. Uh, now, this is terribly important, uh, as we'll see in just a moment. Next slide, please. Uh, another Nobel Prize theory uh, was announced by Levy, Otto Levy and Sir Henry Dale, uh, who announced that uh, the, the neurohumoral theory, which says this, that action currents, and we'll see what they are in a moment, come sweeping down, this electro electrochemical disturbance comes sweeping down the nerve until it comes at the end of the nerve fiber, and it had been thought that it then stimulates electrically right across here. The distance between here and here is only about 200 angstroms. By the way, being among Swedish friends, I might say that uh, uh, Professor Angstrom in Sweden uh, is the man who invented the unit we call the Angstrom unit, and it is one uh, times uh, one uh, 254 millionths of an inch. Uh, that sounds pretty small, and it is. Uh, At any rate, uh, 10 to the 10th of these make uh, the unit, and one of these, the reason for the unit is that one angstrom is about the size of interatomic space. And so if you're going to measure uh, the map of the world, you'd use uh, thousands of miles, but if you're going to measure molecules, use angstroms. Well, this is about 200 angstroms between here. Now, the point about the neurohumoral theory is that the electric uh, wave does not jump across and stimulate electrically, but rather that a very potent compound that Dr. Teddy also mentioned, acetylcholine or norepinephrine, or some very, com uh, very uh, potent uh, transmitter, as it's called, comes here. And this then depolarizes this membrane, causing it to fire electrically in a regenerative action potential that sweeps down the next neuron. Now, may I have the lights, please? This is a very important point because you can see that it emphasizes the discontinuity between neurons rather than a continuity. Uh, Dr. Eccles was a student of Sherrington, and his monumental work on the integrative action of the nervous system pictured a nervous system that uh, reacted when it was acted on, otherwise quiescent in sleep, as was pointed out by Dr. Ketty. When the brain, when the person is asleep, it was assumed that there is rest of the neurons, and this is far from true, if anything, more activity. Well, so we came to the age of localization ushered in by the use of microelectrodes. I'm taking about 10 minutes to sketch in a bit of the history for you so that you can appreciate the current advances. And what happens is this, that in the past, before, you know, 20 years ago, uh, if one wanted to measure the, these electrical potentials sweeping down a nerve, one put a wire and electrode here and another one somewhere else like that and a measuring device like that, we'd use a cathode ray oscilloscope, a voltage amplifier, and lo and behold, a wave was recorded beginning here like that. But one could not with fidelity measure this wave, nor could one measure the properties of this membrane, which is where it lies, by any such method. And the way one can, can do that is by developing microelectrodes, which consist of very thin glass tubes with uh, very fine openings filled with saline, 
And this then goes to the measuring device. Sticking that on the inside, you are in essence measuring the electrical fields right across that membrane. And Hodgkin and Huxley in, in England, in Cambridge, uh, deservedly won the Nobel Prize uh, for their work in which they were able to show that the mechanism of action potential sweeping down a nerve here has to do with the entry of sodium ions into the nerve fiber as the beginning of this wave, as I'll show in just a moment, and the exit of, of uh, potassium ions. Well, now, uh, just at this time, uh, Professor Eccles, uh, who had a lifetime of career in this area, knowing the brain circuits thoroughly, a student of brain circuitry as well as physiology, uh, was able to do uh, something far more difficult than this because these people use giant fibers, enormous big things, a half millimeter in diameter. Uh, uh, that's really big. Uh, use uh, neurons like this. Here is the nerve cell. Sorry, Jack, it uh, looks like, but uh, here is, and here is a microelectrode uh, stuck into it, as Sir John uh, was able to do, sticking electrodes within individual neurons, nerve cells, and recording the action potential generated and the electrical effect membrane potentials within individual nerve cells. And in this way, was able to trace circuitry in the brain uh, by virtue of not a general lead in the, in the brain, but directly within individual neurons. Next slide, please. And uh, here is just an example of what can be done. This is a, uh, the cerebellum is one uh, area in which, uh, you see, I'm giving Sir John's lecture. He talked on philosophy or uh, evolution and so on, and I'm talking on his <laughs> subject. Um, here is the cerebellum. And... Uh, uh, this is a circuitry, if you will, which is par excellence. It uh, makes it possible for us to do learning acts and so on without which we couldn't even walk, we couldn't, and so on. And Dr. Eccles discovered that some of these synapses are uh, inhibitory as well as excitatory. And this whole thing, uh, the, the big conference in Tokyo a year and a half ago, which started things off, and we've held a work session at which he attended, and we are now planning a work session uh, in another few months, uh, attended by engineers, systems analysts, and physicists, circuit analysts, and so on, as well as neurobiologists and all the rest of us, to see if we can't make something out of this cerebellum circuitry, as circuitry. And I cite this because pretty soon I'm going to move away from circuitry, as one of the highlights of uh, really classical physiology. And it is an, a, an indication of what amounts to wired-in circuitry. Now, uh, I hope you'll get the distinction here. Uh, we're going to ask the question, is thinking due to wired-in circuits acting? Uh, and uh, uh, I won't tell you what the answer is yet. I'll find, find out as we go along. But um, there is a difference between global effects and wired-in circuitry effects. Now, certain homeostatic effects like... Uh, but posture, the fact that I can stand up like this uh, means that many, that many impulses are coming from all of my muscles informing my central nervous system that weight is on them and that they'd better contract to keep me upright and so on. That's all automatic. And uh, these are certainly wired in circuits that I breathe as I do, that I keep my temperature constant and all that are certainly due to wired in circuits. Next slide, please. Now, however, uh, what we find is that if we look at the central nervous system in the brain and take all of these wired-in circuits, these automatic circuits, into account and see these are the sensory input. I don't, can you see this? Are these lights killing it? There's the sensory input. Here are the automatic circuits. And here is the brain, the black box of the brain, the primitive forebrain. And then in man, uh, the human neocortex, which has been added to it. We find that if we add all of these circuits up, uh, that it makes up, and here I'm quoting now, to, I wouldn't know about these things, it makes up only something like a thousandth of, there are a thousand times as many cells in the human cortex uh, as there are in all of these circuits put together. Seventy percent of, of the cells are in the cortex in this uh, human neocortex, which is a rather striking thing, I think. May I have the lights, please? Now, some of these circuits are most elaborately traced, as by Hubel and Weasel in the, in the uh, visual circuits, so that it's possible to trace from the eye right into the 
cortex and deeply into the cortex and see their representation in columns in the cortex. This is literally uh, wired in circuitry up to a certain point at least. And of Mount Castle with respect at uh, Baltimore, uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, with respect to tactile uh, sensory mechanisms, which all of this kind of work, elegant, uh, fine localizing work, makes it better, makes it possible for us better to understand perception. And it's been supported by what I would call connectionistic positivism. All brain functions are mediated by spikes over neuronal circuits wired in and on touch that is in the development of the brain and, in, and are deterministic in nature. Yet Mountcastle, uh, in uh, Sir John's book, uh, expresses reservations, as do many other neurophysiologists, concerning the role of this sequential wired in firing of neurons a la classical theory and explaining psychological functions such as memory and learning. I want now to introduce certain dynamic concepts into the neurophysiological story. Uh, in the early 30s, Dr. Uh, Berger, the, it was discovered that the brain, far from being uh, electrically quiet except when acted on or acting, was all the time acting. And uh, you all know the, about the electroencephalogram, uh, electroencephalograph, uh, proving that the brain is active all the time. Brain cells are firing and so on. The brain is not quiescent. It is electrically, dynamically active. As I explained about the sleep situation, as Dr. Ketty pointed out, certain uh, neurons may in fact stop firing, but others, the circuitry is switched and other neurons take over and fire just as much. Now, another aspect of dynamism in uh, neurology, which otherwise had been rather static, we believed the textbook models that we read in our books, you see, and they showed nothing but static neurons. Uh, and uh, the neuron is not that, whatever it is. And one of the things which I'll elaborate on a little more is the discovery by Paul Weiss, one of our associates uh, more than 20 years ago, that the cell body in the neuron also is very active and is biosynthesizing two to one to two or three times its own cell volume per day, and this is passing down the axon all the time. Uh, that's not static. Lashley's paradox uh, of equipotentiality of the cortex uh, is an interesting concept, not, approved, not agreed to by all, that, uh, that uh, certain functions in the, in the cortex can be taken over by other parts of the cortex in a plastic fashion, which would be very difficult to explain uh, in terms of wiring in circuitry. Uh, certain experiments by some Japanese investigators on the motor cortex seem to support this, though Lashley's original experiments are subject to reservations. Well, now, in the case of dendrites, there are some dendrites, may I see the next slide, please, which are so extensive and can be so remote, and not necessarily this one, this is shown only as an example, uh, the fantastic dendritic tree of some of these cells. As I look out of my study window in the winter time at, in Boston and see the trees in our forest behind the house. Some of the trees look like this, pointing up to, to heaven and seeing the sky through them, remind me of these dendrites with not thousands, but hundreds and thousands, and maybe millions of branches and so on. Now, they're very remote from the cell, and in many of these cases, it is very improbable, indeed, I think uh, quite impossible, that the electrical activity in these remote regions could stimulate the cell body to fire in a, in a regenerative uh, action potential mechanism. Well, uh, they probably play an important role, and uh, at least uh, Ross Aidey, one of our group, feels that dendro dendrodendritic interaction may be responsible for certain uh, potentials which are observed in the brain, and possibly also for certain psychological functions, including that of memory. <coughs> producing DC effects. Now, as opposed to wired in circuitry, are certain effects observed, may I have the lights, please, are certain effects which are observed simultaneously in many brain regions as though the uh, neuronal architecture and neurophysiology were not as important as some undetermined processes which we can call field effects or global effects, DC direct current effects, and I'll just mention a few of these, but it's by way of giving us a word of caution 
that we cannot necessarily explain all in terms of classical neurophysiology. There are the steady potentials. Dr. Rowland at uh, Cleveland has reported, has measured uh, direct current potential changes of a global nature which accompany psychological phenomena. For example, cats which have been trained uh, to do certain things with uh, electrodes in their brains and with the direct current uh, uh, very carefully, uh, electrodes very carefully balanced, uh, show changes of potential of a direct current sort when they perform the learned act and not when they do not perform the learned act. In other words, it depends on the performance of the psychological function as to whether this uh, field effect is observed. Cats in estrus, for example, show potentials which are somewhat proportional to the sex drive and various other uh, drives, psychological drives, seem to result in these global potential changes. Dr. Aidy, at the uh, uh, now in uh, La Jolla, University of California uh, at San Diego, has found an extremely interesting effect in which uh, there is, he observes with electrodes in the cortex, uh, using uh, high frequency, uh, low current uh, pr uh, probes to uh, study the electrical impedance, as it's called, is a mixture of uh, resistive and capacitive components. Uh, at any rate, he's just finding out the resistance of brain regions rather than stimulating the brain, and he finds that uh, this resistance or impedance uh, decreases uh, markedly when the animal, the cat, performs some previously trained uh, learned task and does not happen when the cat does not perform the task. Uh, there is no change if there is an incorrect performance, and this suggests, suggests certain changes uh, to 80, which uh, he analyzes it in the following way, that these changes, these electrical changes, which are global in nature, uh, rather than following neuronal tracts, probably do not involve the neurons as such and may not involve the, the glia too much, but do involve the intercellular spaces. Uh, the intercellular spaces of brain are very interesting uh, a very interesting substance. Uh, you know, perhaps, that our body tissues are, are flung in connective tissue, and connective tissue has the protein collagen in it and a lot of very high molecular weight carbohydrates called polysaccharides, which give that uh, curious uh, texture to the intercellular material. Now, in the brain, there is no collagen, yet there is this uh, high molecular weight polysaccharide, uh, ground substance as it's called, and uh, what Aidy believes is that when this uh, psychological performance occurs, there is a sudden drop in resistance of this intercellular space, and he believes that is due to the combination of calcium ions with these negatively charged macromolecules. Well, this is a very interesting theory. The reason I mention it is not only because I'm interested in it, but because it suggests uh, that effects of psychological, hence also neurophysiological, importance may occur without reference, that's the wrong word, uh, involving primarily intercellular space. And this effect was considered by AD to be closely related to the readout of stored information, and he believes his data invite the consideration of the role of extra neuronal elements in transaction and storage of information in brain tissue a concept hardly compatible with classical neurophysiological concepts. Uh, along the same line, AD found coordinative activity between large masses of cortical tissue as measured by coherence, that is corresponding frequencies, between them depending critically on anticipatory and recapitulatory aspects of novel or hazardous experience. Now, what, uh, what uh, that means is that AD is the guy who has been measuring the, uh, the electroencephalographs of, of, of astronauts. And uh, he showed these to us, and uh, uh, I, I'm not uh, expert enough to interpret them, but he pointed out the, the things and said he had never seen such evidence of concentrated uh, awareness as in an astronaut at blastoff when he was sitting on top of an apparatus containing 20,000 pieces of equipment which were all bought, to, bought from the lowest bidder. And, uh, <laughs> he 
said there was concentrated attention. Well, uh, at any rate, uh, 20 minutes later or something like that, there was synchronous firing of all regions of the brain. Many regions of the brain participated in synchronous firing, and this I would regard, though I'm not an expert in this field, as a global effect. Indeed, some uh, mathematical modeling now tends to reject the telephone exchange model uh, with action potentials passing over elaborate connections between cells. For example, Zeman in England defines thought as the state of the whole brain given by the rate of firing of all of its 10 to the 10th, that means 10 billion neurons. This is a probabilistic theory, and I could tell you some other experiments, for example, those of Roy John, which suggest similar things. It would seem that further refinements of synaptology and axonology alone will not lead to an understanding of memory and learning. Uh, we're always dangerous in predicting anything like that, but uh, from what I have just suggested, perhaps that would follow. We are entering then a new era of dynamism and specificity at or near the molecular level. And uh, one must be either brave or rash to predict the outcome at this time. Uh, we shall now consider some of the biophysical and biogenetic factors which produce this dynamism. First, uh, this molecular dynamism will be considered uh, with respect to uh, three crucial areas, uh, with respect to the membrane primarily, of three crucial areas, the axon, the synapse, and the cell body or dendrosomatic uh, complex. May I have the next slide, please? First, with respect to the axon membrane, I've already explained that the action potential uh, occurs when sodium ions suddenly are able to enter. The permeability of the nerve fibers increase greatly. Sodium ions enter, and that's the rising phase of the action potential. And then potassium ions go out, and that's the falling phase. And this whole thing as a wave glides along at about 100 meters a second. Next slide, please. Now, the question, uh, that's the Hodgkin-Huxley sodium hypothesis, which won them a Nobel Prize. Now, the next thing is, how does it work, which they did not, uh, did not come to grips with, not being molecular scientists. Their work was primarily uh, on, the, on the electrochemistry, the inorganic electrochemistry of the, of the nerve. The question is, how can the molecules of the membrane uh, make possible this fast wave? Well, first we have to consider membrane structure generally, and it's usually considered that there's a bimolecular layer of mixed fatty compounds called lipids and a monomolecular layer of protein on the inside. This is a protein molecule, and that's another one. And these are lipid molecules, and here I've peeled off the top layer to show you the fatty molecules sticking in here like that. Well, anyway, that's the surface membrane, and the probability is that it's not continuous but has gaps like this, slabs or micelles and there may be equipment mounted in these slabs. However, we don't know that. Next slide, please. Uh, now, to find out about this, it was necessary to, uh, to study the giant fiber of the squid. You know, an animal is created, has been created, I believe, for the solution of all neurophysiological, all neurophysiological problems. The squid undoubtedly was created for the solution of the nerve problem because he has an enormous giant fiber, a millimeter in diameter in the big ones that we get in Chile, and you simply take that nerve fiber out and uh, can work with it directly. And if we, uh, next slide please, if we, here is that nerve fiber, a millimeter in diameter, and if we stick a little tube in here, we have found methods of dissolving this normal axoplasm, which is very viscous, uh, and uh, with a saline mixture containing certain uh, sustain reducing agents and when that has been so done one can clean out all of this material so that one has uh, no visible uh, remnant left of the axoplasm and this nerve fiber will go on firing action potentials for hours uh, with this artificial saline if now we inject into that an enzyme that does that chews up proteins a proteolytic enzyme the action potential promptly is destroyed as is the polarization the resting potential which uh, shows uh, when a thing is alive. All living cells have a resting potential across them of 50 or 60 millivolts. And so uh, this thing will continue to flow like this. So the question is, how can we find out what protein or proteinaceous material is involved, if in fact it is? And one way to do it is to use the wonderful new techniques of immunology. 
Uh, and uh, the way to do that, at least one way we have done in our station in Chile, where we get these big squids, is to extrude the normal axoplasm of many squid fibers and inject that into the toe pads of a rabbit. The rabbit, over a period of some weeks, will, um, will obligingly produce antibodies against any proteins that were in that, which served as antigens. You then take the serum from the rabbit and put that in the saline that you inject into here, and lo and behold, that serum blocks the action potential in a matter of five to 10 minutes uh, without influence on the resting potential, which suggests that here we have a serological indication that in fact proteins are uh, involved in the action potential. And uh, we have suggested that the molecular effector of this fast reaction uh, is, uh, we'll call it an electrogenic protein. May I have the lights, please? Uh, well, now, what, uh, how can a protein, uh, by some uh, change of some sort, cause ions to flow in or flow out uh, in a thousandth or ten thousandth of a second? Uh, oh, you going to chain me down here? <laughs> I'm from Missouri. Right now. Uh, well, one way is to fractionate, uh, by phys physical chemical methods, to fractionate the axoplasm proteins and isolate the individual proteins and make antibodies against these individual proteins and find out which one of them is responsible. We have already done that for the, ma for the major protein of the axon, the fibrous protein, and it has no effect. Therefore, we can say that that protein can be eliminated. Now. Uh, we found that certain groups called sulfhydryl or SH, combination of sulfur and hydrogen, SH groups in proteins are required for the action potential. Uh, the way this was done was to perfuse, may I have the next slide please, to perfuse uh, the, the uh, axon with uh, reagents which are mercurial, say, which combine with SH groups like mercuric chloride or para-hydroxymercury benzoate and compounds like that. And when you do, here's the point, is the resting potential, and that's the action potential, that's the total potential, and there up there shows the wave. At this point, you've knocked out the action potential. This is not reversed by perfusing with salt alone, but you can reverse it by reducing this compound with uh, mercaptoethanol. That is to say, if we now kick that mercurial off of there and bring this group back to an SH condition, then the action potential is brought back again. And this suggests that we have here a possible reversible change in the molecule itself, uh, which, is, uh, which results in, in gating, as we say, permitting sodium ions to enter. Now, uh, may I have the lights a moment, please? Uh, it has been suggested that our concept of the surface membrane, as seen in the electron microscope, uh, that our concept of the actual molecular structure, as uh, deduced from electron microscopy and X-rays and other means, have got to be altered. That it is not, perhaps, as Robertson and others have claimed, a continuous layer of lipid like this and monolayers of protein and so on, but that, uh, well, a variety of models have recently been suggested. Uh, Green at Wisconsin has suggested one, but uh, very interestingly, uh, just last month, an, a model was suggested by Wallach and Thaler in which the protein part of the molecule uh, has regions here which like water and interact with water up here, and regions down here that don't like water but interact with the fats, with the bimolecular layer of the lipid. Well, now, why do I bother you with technical things like this? Well, uh, one reason is this, that that membrane is vital to the propagation of any information in the nervous system, I believe. I think most people would agree. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I'm now going to tell you about a piece of work which, I, which has just been published, or maybe not quite, uh, a piece of work by some people uh, who have come from physics. Uh, one of these is Changeur from Paris, who works with Monod and Jacob. Uh, and uh, Charles Kittel, who is one of the country's, if not the world's, great theoretical physicist at the University of California. And this paper by Shanger, Thierry, Tung, and Kittel proposes that the membrane, may I have the next slide, please, consists of uh, repeating globular units, which they call protomeres. Sorry. Uh, sorry. One moment. This is our model 
Oh, yes. I must tell you about this. This is our model of the way the molecules gate the action potential through a change in conformation of the protein. Here, these are protein molecules, and here's a pore. Sodium can't get through the way it is here in the resting state. But when it's active, these uh, suck in the middle, so to speak, become flatter here and squatter in this direction. And the result is there's more space, and sodium comes through. It's a very crude model. But the important thing about it is that there is a change of configuration or conformation, as it's called, of the protein molecules which subserves this fast reaction. Now I'm coming to the point uh, that this model of, uh, may I have the light, please? Oh, sorry, may I have to see the next slide? I'm uh, getting mixed up here. <laughs> yes, uh, some people assume that there are different protein gadgets, as I call them, that admit sodium and those that, uh, that uh, handle potassium. These are just uh, graphic, of course, meaning that proteins are precisely constructed which allow these ions to get through, and that's the explanation. May I see the next slide? There it is. Well, now here are the protomeres that have been suggested by Kittel and others. Uh, these globular units, repeating units, are said to exist in a two-dimensional crystalline array, or lattice with cooperative properties capable of existing in several stable conformational forms reversibly. What does all that mean? May I have the lights, please? Now that I may borrow uh, President Carlson here for a moment, uh, grab hold of that molecule and... and uh, thank you, just stretch it out. Now, this is the way a protein molecule looks when it's biosynthesized in the genetic equipment of the cell, when it comes off the ribosomes in the cell factory, as Dr. Holger Hedain talked about. And because certain regions along this string-like molecule uh, have different side chains than others, when the constraints are removed, you see certain of them remain uh, helical and others not. And that's the properties of these helical regions are quite different from these. These are capable of certain quantum effects that these are not. Thank you. Uh, uh, and the next, this, this first one was called the primary conformation. The second, this one here is the secondary conformation. And now what happens is the whole thing balls up like this. And we have a balled up globular molecule. And the whole thing, it takes only this much volume. But it isn't done like this. It's done in an absolutely specific fashion. X-ray diffraction shows that every atom is in the precise place. And there would be something of the way that globular protein looks with regions that are helical and others not helical. Now, uh, these molecules uh, are capable of changing their configuration. And they would do it by something like that, you see, uh, opening up and closing like this. And that's a change of conformation. And what's important about it is that it is a fast reaction. Not fast in the nerve sense of a thousandth of a second or something like that, but fast to the 10 to the minus ninth to 10 to the minus twelfth of a second. And these conformational changes are what we may rely on for readout of information stored in protein macromolecules. If uh, because of the structure of the molecule, its relaxation, and the way in which it can go through these gyrations, it being very specific, just as specific as the composition is, you see the readout may be capable of very fast, uh, fast readout. And the result is that in an enzyme, for example, is believed to open up like this, allow the substrate to enter, act on it, and close again. And the whole thing goes very fast indeed, uh, a, million, a million times in a second, perhaps. Now, the way in, now, here's a protomer, a la Kittel, and here's another one. And they're next to each other, like this. Now, if these helical portions are next to each other like this, you are, and this is a true crystalline lattice in two dimensions, you are permitted to apply certain quantum uh, considerations, and they have done so. And uh, out of this, out of these, pro out of the properties come out of this, see, see the next slide, please. Um, certain properties, for example, this enzyme here called chymotrypsinogen, is a, uh, digests proteins, uh, works only because of the opposition of three of its groups here, two histidines and a serine. And this three-dimensional array of the, of the molecule, you see, makes it possible for these three groups to get together. And when they're together, it's an active group or site. And that does the active business. And if the molecule pulls apart slightly, it's no longer active. Next slide. And when molecules 
uh, are influenced at one point. Uh, here's, here's the active site. I've just talked about the enzymic active site. Something happens there. Lo and behold, something happens at another part of the molecule, which we would never have predicted uh, 10 years ago. And this is called allosterism, and it means that something happening here can, in, here can influence what happens here. And indeed, this is a terribly important thing now because the product of a got the president working. <laughs> uh, the thank you, Dr. Cross. The allosteric reaction is now considered to be a vital part of cell biochemistry and biophysics, and I believe that we have to apply allosteric concepts to an understanding of the way in which brain proteins work. May I have the next slide, please? Oh. Well, uh, may I finish just this one thing by saying that uh, this article by Kittel suggests that interaction occurs between neighboring protomers and their ligands and conformational changes considered as phase changes, which, which uh, are very fast, and Dr. Kachowski and our group had already postulated on thermodynamic grounds must exist, are related to the response of the excited, excited, excited axon membrane and to the effect of pharmacological reagents. These are physicists and chemists talking. Now, next I go very quickly on to the synaptic membrane, and if I may have that next slide. Very little is known, actually, about the properties of the synaptic membrane. This is a gross uh, caricature by Robertus, but at any rate, this is the presynaptic and this is the postsynaptic. The impulse comes from here, and here are the vesicles Dr. Ketty talked about, which contain the transmitter co compounds, which are generated, which when liberated here, cause the firing of this thing. Well, now, between, there are literally seen here, regions here in the electron microscope, which have curious uh, differentiation of structure. In between here, there tends to be these uh, striated regions of protein, and underneath is a subsynaptic web. And in the next slide, I think, is an electron micrograph by Pappas, if I'm not mistaken, uh, showing the actual way it looks. Here is the presynaptic, here the postsynaptic, same here. And here are the vesicles. Now you've seen vesicles, these little bladder things which contain the stimulating uh, transmitter. And in between, there is some kind of structure. And here, there is also some kind of structure. Well, uh, proteins have a degree of specificity, which we may need for a synaptic uh, structure. Both of these require dynamic molecular equipment, according to current views. Uh, now, may I see the next slide, please? It can be argued that a specificity at synaptic junctions may be molecular and protein in nature. And here's the line of argument. If you have a circuit, a neuronal circuit, and uh, they branch, this might branch into 100 branches. And let us say this specific circuit needs to be activated for the readout of some physiological function. Well, what says that it should go this way rather than this way? Well, possibly, next slide, uh, the use of proteins uh, here is in yellow is shown that this cell has a particular protein in it that this one doesn't have. That the generation of a protein-antiprotein interaction here, which we call molecular recognition, uh, it's this kind of thing that prevents uh, infection um, in our bodies by immunological means. Uh, antigen antibody is just such a molecular recognition in which the antigen is recognized by the antibody and thrown out of action so that we don't get sick. Well, maybe here we have that kind of specific interaction of protein-antiprotein at, at the axonal, at the uh, synaptic membrane. This is pure speculation. We have no evidence on this at all. We would have to go hunting for a protein, as was found in the case of blood called gamma globulin, which is the basis of molecular recognition in disease, to see whether, in fact, the nervous system has developed such a protein. Uh, we are looking along these lines, but I have nothing to report. Then comes the dendrosomatic membrane, the question of the cell membrane. May I have the lights, please? And. Uh, I'm not going to take very much time for this because we know very little about it. Uh, there is some evidence 
that the dendritic protein might be different in nature from the cell membrane itself, the somatic membrane. Uh, I won't go into detail about this, but some of them have been isolated. I should have said that it is now possible to isolate the synaptic mechanisms and actually determine something about their proteins by immunological and analytical methods, so that molecular science is zeroing in on the mechanism of synaptic action. Okay, now I must go along very quickly. I want to talk about cell biosynthesis. I told you, may I see the next slide, that the cell is a very busy factory, the neuron. This is how it looks, and uh, you have to take my word for it that that's the picture of a very busy cell. Uh, the nucleus and all the cytoplasmic equipment, uh, it's, it's busier than the most busy gland cell, as a matter of fact. Next slide. And uh, neurons uh, have been seen for years by histologists to have these, these uh, regions called missile granules, which stain with uh, basophilic uh, stains. And this has also been accepted by histologists as the evidence of activity in neurons. And now, next slide. We see from electron microscopy that when we look at such a granule, which is this thing, that is simply packed with membranes and ribosomes, as Dr. Houdain told you, is the basis of biosynthesis of protein. <coughs> In other words, this explains that the neuron is indeed a very busy factory. Next slide, please. <coughs> and the experiment that Weiss did was to put a clamp on a nerve like this, chronically, in an animal, which I hope didn't hurt him. I'm sure it didn't. And uh, uh, the animal survived the experiment. And, uh, and here, the, he found that in about two weeks' time, the, uh, the fiber bulged proximal to the, to the clamp. Uh, and he rightly concluded that fluid must be flowing all the time down here and producing this hydrostatic pressure. Now, nobody believed it, including Weiss. And, uh, it was sort of forgotten for about 20 years, and it has been reactivated by his own experiments and by many others the world around, and we are now going to have a work session on this subject in April, and it's very exciting. I've just been telephoning to the people, and they've been reporting uh, what uh, the word is, and the word is that the movement in the, in the axons is very much greater. May I have the lights, please? What, may I see the, yes. Uh, very much greater than anyone had supposed. Weiss had said that it moves down at about a millimeter a day. Uh, radioisotope work now has suggested the movement may be 10 times that or 50 times that, as much as uh, one to two millimeters per minute instead of per day uh, has been reported. And it seems as though uh, it seems as though uh, the, the material on the inside of this nerve fiber is in very active movement all the time, uh, streaming movement. We call it cyclosis, uh, in which the granules are moving about constantly. And there is a translatory movement from the cell body going on down. And this can be very fast. <laughs> now, uh, may I have the next slide, please? The question is, what is behind this movement? This might be fundamental. Well, it turns out that neurons have a fibrous gadget called neurofilaments, which go from the cell body all the way down the axon to the very endings, never dividing. And at the, at the near molecular level, next slide, when looked at with the electron microscope, this is how they look. This is 100 angstrom units across, one two millionth of an inch across. And these are continuous protein fibers, and uh, taking no time for you to, te to tell you what took us 20 years to do, next slide, was uh, that this was found to be made up by globular molecules which get hooked together to form strings like this. These strings get wound around each other in a threefold helix, we believe, which leaves a hole down the middle. And this is the thing that goes continuously from the nucleus on down to the nerve ending. May I just show the lights on this, please? This is a model of it, and uh, the globular molecule is is a little thing like this, weighing about 30,000, where water, where, where hydrogen is one, water is 18. And there it forms strands like that, and these wrap around helically to form the neurofilament. Now, the point is that these things can form membranes. As you see, this then would be a membrane, wouldn't it, if you unwound it? And uh, the thought is now, among cytologists, that 
It is the interaction of uh, units like this called micro, microtubules, which are at the bottom of, of, of contractility generally. And it may be that here we have something which can tell us about the, about the transport of material from the nerve cell downwards. Next slide, please. And uh, mitochondria, which are the power plants of the cell, these are little granule things. They furnish the energy of the cell, the gasoline, as it were, of the cell, in the form of what's called ATP. These things also move downward. Turns out that these have DNA in them, each one, and the question is whether they are encoding information when they get down to the end of the neuron. Probability is not, because the DNA is big enough only to encode the protein for its own structure. May I have the light, please? Now, uh, I'd like quickly to come to the subject of biogenetics. I've been talking about biophysics pretty much. The excitability, we've indicated, of the axon membrane is strongly influenced by certain common metabolic biochemical uh, functions such as sulfhydryl SH and SH reagents block it. Now, could there be a feedback between the cell membrane and the biosynthetic mechanisms of the cell in such a way that the nucleus, which has the DNA, the controlling, the control of the cell, is able through intermediates to get hold of the cell membrane and in that way to couple biosynthetic and biogenetic with bioelectrical, hence control, mechanisms in the cell. Well, let's examine this. Uh, actually, the transmitters in the cortex are unknown and uh, May I see the next slide, please? This is how, as Dr. Ketty told us yesterday, that if you uh, put very active biogenic amines upon certain nerve cells, they will fire, be excited by it. So here, here's a multi-barreled uh, 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 capillary over which you can inject different kinds of compounds and see whether the cell will fire and therefore whether the compound acts like a transmitter. And using uh, uh, mechanisms like this, People have investigated the cortex to try to find out what is the transmitter in the cortex, and the answer so far as people who have testified at our center is concerned is that nobody knows. However, compounds like aspartic acid and glutamic acid do stimulate, and uh, Curtis, though not calling them uh, transmitters, uh, do, does believe that they are very capable of exciting. Now, interestingly, Another Nobel laureate at the Rockefeller University in New York found that if he takes these very compounds and puts them on brain slices, they are not only excited electrically, but their protein synthesis is inhibited. This suggests a clear relationship between gene expression and uh, repressors. Now I want, I'm going to indulge in about uh, five minutes of an explanation of something that Dr. Hedain referred to and which we need to know about in detail if we're going to understand the way in which a cell neuron can uh, influence its own behavior, so to speak. And next slide, I'm going to take an excursion into the question of biosynthesis, the way in which a gene controls the synthesis of a protein. And it's going to be done in about 1.6 minutes. And this is the double helix of DNA, and it has four, uh, four different compounds in it, uh, like four decks, four uh, suits in a deck of cards called A, T, C, and G. And A is always opposite uh, uh, U uh, when this is read out. Sorry, uh, this is the RNA now being formed on the surface of the template DNA. In other words, the message is in the gene from there to there. And this is continuous for way, it would go way up to the next county, perhaps, in, in length. Uh, it's an enormous DNA surface. And only a part of it, as Holger Hedden rightly pointed out yesterday, is being activated for the readout of one gene. So an A is formed opposite a T, a U opposite an A. And in fact, this is the messenger which reads out this information in complementary code, comes onto a surface called the ribosomes in the cytoplasm and sits there as messenger and through a mechanism here of, of this is transcription, this is translation from RNA, the messenger RNA, to protein by virtue of these soluble triplet uh, parts of the 
transfer RNA. I'm not going into detail. Suffice it to say that this code was broken by Nirenberg and Ochoa uh, so that we know which protein, which amino acid is, corresponds to which triplet uh, like this. Uh, and we find out that uh, this can be synthesized. The protein which is synthesized is absolutely specifically determined by the messenger here, which is on the ribosome. And then these break off, and you've got the primary chain of a protein. Next slide, please. All right, well, now that's the mechanism. Here, however, is the situation that uh, this is DNA, this red thing. And it is uh, apparently true that the gene is turned off most of the time, as Hedin said. but. Uh, and it's turned off by means of what are called repressor molecules, thought to be proteins, because the affinity of the protein for the DNA is very great. And when this is on here, this, this enzyme, which causes this messenger to be formed, is blocked, so it can't trans, uh, transcribe. You only have to add certain molecules called inducers to such a system, and an inducer will combine with the protein. That kicks it off of the DNA, turns on the gene, and the darn thing starts to, to uh, produce protein, as you see here, to produce the messenger RNA, which eventually then produces protein. In other words, molecules can suppress, uh, turn off a gene, and other molecules can, when combining with that uh, turner offer or repressor, can kick it off and cause a synthesis to start. Next slide, please. This is the normal situation, as I've explained, that an uh, enzyme polymerizes the RNA, which goes off into the cytoplasm of the cell and on the ribosomes produces protein. Next slide. And this is called repression. Now, a system might be busy making protein when a molecule comes along and by combining with a potential repressor causes its affinity to be very great for the DNA, and so it combines with it. And when it does, it turns off this polymerizing enzyme and thus turns off the machinery. So this, in short, is the way in which we think at the moment. This is all based on bacterial experiments. We know very little about vertebrate cells and nothing about neurons, though we had a work session on this topic. Um, you can see that it's, it's vital to know something about the way in which compounds can combine with repressors and activators in turning genes on and off and which genes and, and along the, the DNA. Well, it's possible that uh, transmitters and other biogenic compounds do act as uh, to turn genes on and off like this. Next slide. At any rate, this gives some indication of how uh, we can possibly couple the genetic factor with the bioelectric factor at the membrane. Now, this slide shows how it might conceivably happen. Here is the input from a neuron. And here are the vesicles. It stimulates the neuron here. And ions come in, sodium ions come in, for example. And these ions and metabolites and transmitters coming to the DNA might derepress or activate the DNA to produce certain gene products via the messenger RNA, which then come over to the active cell membrane of the neuron, which can cause firing of the neuron. Now, I hope in all this Walter words that it's become clear that membrane properties, the membrane from the input here, the membrane where the, elect where, the, uh, where the impulse is going to fire on the neuron, that this may be related to the DNA and the biosynthetic properties of the cell. The question of the way in which uh, innate instinctual behavior is uh, mediated uh, certainly comes in here. Uh, I'll come to that perhaps in a little bit. May I have the lights, please? A recent model uh, by Sickle and McClure suggests a detailed way in which uh, something like this might conceivably occur. Well, I'd like to finish this section by talking on a system in which apparently neurons can be modified by their, uh, by their inputs uh, as though their experience caused them to remember or learn something, in, in uh, broadly speaking, and in quotes. Uh, J. 
Generally, the wired-in connectivistic deterministic view assumes that all synaptic junctions established genetically and function automatically in a classical manner, and that memory is the establishment of new pathways, new synaptic pathways, by repeated use of, ex of existing synaptic connections. Uh, some experiments done by Dr. Morell in, uh, in Sanford uh, are, might be very crucial here because what he did was to have an electrode in a cell in the cortex, and he did 900 of them, and uh, uh, 800 of the 900 behaved in a stereotype way, that is, uh, having the electrode in and recording the response of the neuron, it's firing all the time anyway, and it gives a spectrum of response. This is all uh, computerized, uh, time average and so on in a computer. Uh, he now, uh, having learned what is the characteristic response fire of this neuron, simulates visually, and this response pattern of this neuron is altered. Uh, he now goes to auditory stimulation, and the response pattern, the histogram of response, is again different. If he goes back now to the visual stimulation, it is not the way it was before, but it's still different. And when he goes to no stimulation at all, it is not the same as it was before. As I say, only 100 of the 900 were like this. 800 were the same no matter what his input was and came back to what they, roughly what they were before. And this suggests that uh, somehow information is stored in the cell, which ten tells it to, to behave differently as a result of its, so to speak, experience, its input. And this might uh, be a model. Uh, of course, our neurophysiological friends will say it isn't the neuron alone because it's in a network with other cells, but Kandel, working with aplasia, uh, got similar results which, in the case of neurons which were quite alone and not connected to other nerves. Now, what's it all mean? It means, I think, that in this case, neurons may learn from experience and that this suggests that DNA does in RNA protein, the biosynthetic cycle, may in fact be coupled to the neuronal membrane. And this would be the beginning, perhaps, this is all speculative, might be the beginning of uh, an opening to the question of how experience might be stored. Well, I'm sorry that I've taken so long. I'd like, in closing, simply to say that I think that this kind of work presents neurobiology neurobiophysics in the context of all the other neurosciences presents a new opportunity and a challenge. There is the need for interdisciplinary cooperation. If I may see this next slide, please, with your patience. I, oh, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but this is Manfred Eigen's slide. This shows time, and it's on logarithmic terms, and here's one second. Over here at the far end is 10 to the 17th seconds, which I think is the age of the universe, something like 5 billion years. And over here is 10 to the minus 23rd seconds, which I think is the shortest interval we know, which is the time it takes light to go across the smallest elementary particle of the nucleus. And uh, our, our experience, our experience as human beings uh, it comes in this area here of a few seconds to minutes or, or hours and, you know, years, that sort of thing right in here. Um, the fastest uh, physical thing with which we are acquainted uh, under normal circumstances is the absorption of a quantum of light, which is 10 to the minus 15th of a second. Now, in, blue, in green plants, uh, light is absorbed, I mean, quanta are absorbed uh, in 10 to the minus 9th or so of a second. But here is a range from 10 to the minus 10th to one second about which there is no experience, no, obviously no experience, but which is uh, just in the area where what uh, Eigen calls fast reactions occur. These are quantum chemical reactions, reactions of cooperative properties when something happens in one end of a molecule like this, something is going to happen somewhere else, and these are called cooperative properties within one macromolecular covalent chain. And this is of the essence, and these are fast reactions. Now, uh, there is reason to believe that in this area, and here is where a lot of exploration is now being made, 10 to the minus 6, uh, 10 to the, the diffusion limit is 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 9th and 10th of a second, 
And you see neurological time is just very, very long compared to these reactions that read out and fast reactions, global reactions conceivably in the brain might involve this type of reaction. I put this on the board simply to give you a perspective of fast reactions as compared to physiology. You see, people think, how can chemistry do anything for us in brain science when uh, action currents uh, go so fast? Well, what do you mean fast? You see, this isn't fast at all. Next slide, please. Well, uh, <laughs> my apologies to punch, but uh, this is meant to be DNA, and that's RNA, and that's uh, protein enzyme, and that's non-enzyme -pro non protein, and I don't know what's below here. The question I'm asking is, what's above him? And what pulls his strings, or does he pull the strings? Well, uh, Dr. Eccles and I believe that there, that probably there is something pulling his strings. But what kind of coupling there is, uh, I don't know. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now, what I'd like to say is that in addressing ourselves to the brain science, to, to the total neuroscience problem, we have three general areas, that of molecular science, as I've talked about just now. There is the neural science, uh, meaning uh, brain circuits, neurophysiology, neuroanatomy, and so on. And then there is behavioral science, as we see here, just looking at how people behave in psychology and psychiatry and so on. Now, the words that people use in these three areas are so different as to make communication almost impossible. There is a great barrier of communication between each of these. And it's only by breaking down these barriers of communication and developing methods by which uh, the, conceptu uh, the conceptual inputs from one can go into the other that we can make real progress in these sciences. Next slide, please. And uh, in order to, well, here you see the barrier of communication between the systems people, the brain scientists in general, the mathematical, the artificial intelligence, and all these people on the one hand, and the analytical reductionist people, chemists and so on, biophysicists, they work with uh, real molecules and aqueous solutions, so I call them wets. I'm a wet. Uh, whereas these, these scientists work primarily with uh, systems and uh, are not chemists, and I call them dry. And the dries don't speak to the wets. They just have different kind of conceptual. They speak, of course, but I mean not meaningfully. And so there is a great energy barrier here of communication. And uh, this group that I've been referring to as NRP is meant to tunnel in the thermodynamic sense through such a barrier. Next slide. And uh, the way it's done in this particular group, and I, I give this only as a model, because at lunch we were talking about certain religious conferences and the need for uh, commu real communication on, on topics which were disparate uh, between the two groups. And here is a model. Uh, about 32 people have aggregated, called associates, and uh, here's biology, physics, and chemistry, and uh, the component of each individual uh, would determine where his circle is. I think my circle's there, I don't know. But anyway, you can see that we've got very well represented, the physicists, the chemists, and the psychologists, and, and so on. And next slide, please. And these people meet regularly. They publish a bulletin. I, I don't get anything for this, by the way. And uh, <laughs> may I have the lights, please? And uh, this, uh, you pay for it. The US government pays for it anyway. At any rate, these work sessions are held. And uh, this, this effort is now four years old, going on to five. And I can report that it has proved very valuable indeed, that it is an effort to stimulate uh, interaction between the brain sciences and neural sciences. And may I say that the importance to man uh, is so great that these individuals, all of them very busy indeed, but because of a great commitment to the belief that we science must learn more about man, as Dr. Eccles said, not merely his brain, but also his mind, and that it's the primary problem of science today. Without any question, uh, space science uh, and so on isn't in it compared with the science of the brain for the reason that we must soon learn about thinking and memory uh, and learning in man uh, in order to make uh, life on this planet stable. Uh, not only to learn something about thinking, 
so that we can think better and thereby make a better science eventually and a better society, but because of man's wish to know more about himself and whether we will ever do that in the sense of the inner self that uh, philosophers talk about, I do not know, but I have a strong belief, a strong conviction that by the interplay of scientists with great motivation, much will and can be done and must be done, and that this will lead, uh, in my opinion, to rather striking changes in the whole profile of our science and along the lines that Dr. Josephson said, and I'm glad he said it, he saved me at least three minutes, uh, that here is an opportunity for the race to make a contribution uh, in a truly sci simply scientific sort, which is needed and which I believe will be more salutary than any other thing that scientists could do at the present time. Sorry to have taken more time, Mr. President, than I should have. I know that none of us would have wanted to shorten this address at all because we've certainly profited from it greatly. Personally, I want to thank him uh, in my own behalf because I've never been a laboratory assistant in any science laboratory in the country, and I know that none of our st science staff would appoint me to such a role, but I have now been a laboratory assistant to the great Dr. Francis Schmidt of MIT. <laughs> and I